Turn to Exodus 20, please. Read from the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 21. We're in the Tenth Commandment today. So we should be finishing up this series very shortly. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 21. I'll begin reading. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your word and your law. We pray that you would teach us from it, instruct us, convict us of sin, draw us closer to Christ. For the lost, we pray they would be saved, and we pray for your spirit to anoint the hearing and preaching of your word. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. We're in the Ten Commandments again, and as we have been for some time, and the Ten Commandments are the natural law, the law of nature. So I said last week, if you want to live in accordance with nature, live by the Ten Commandments. This is the way that God has designed the world to work. If you want to live naturally, this is how you live. This is the constitution of reality. If you want to live in a way that is consistent with reality, this is how you live. It's the real way of living. It's the natural way of living, is living by the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments provide light to our paths. The law of God is a lamp unto our footsteps. Without the law of God, we'd be walking around in a dark room, bumping into things, tripping over things, getting hurt, bumping into other people. But with the law of God, the lights are turned on, and now we can see where we should go and where we should not go. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, are counselors within our ears. They instruct us as we go along the way. They talk to us. So as you're going along the path of life, and you want to know the wisdom of God, listen to the Ten Commandments and figure out how they apply to the various situations that you face in your life, counselors in your ears. So while they provide for us the natural way of living, the real way of living, light unto our paths, and they speak to us as counselors, they cannot save us. That's one thing that they cannot do. For that, we need Jesus Christ. He is the only salvation. And so the Ten Commandments will convict you of your sin, and they'll teach you that you're a sinner, but you need to look to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. The Ten Commandments are inflexible. It's cold, hard law. It is immovable. It's a principle that cannot change or adapt to the situation. It applies to differently to different situations, but they're inflexible. And if you want to be saved and find forgiveness for your sins, don't go to the Ten Commandments. Go to Jesus. He will forgive you. He died for sinners. He was crucified for sinners. Shed his blood to atone for your sin, to propitiate God's wrath, turn his wrath 
away from you. So run to Jesus. The Ten Commandments search in your heart. They needle around in there and they point out your sins. And when you find the Ten Commandments pushing in on that pressure point, what you need to do is you need to go to Christ. You don't stay there. You go to Jesus immediately. That should be your instinct as a Christian to run to Jesus. Last week we finished my second sermon on the Ninth Commandment. I preached two sermons on the Ninth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Well, today we move on to the Tenth Commandment. Last week we talked about how to wade through allegations and talking about other people while all the while upholding the Ninth Commandment. How do you live in a world where you have to communicate and often communicate about other people? How do you live in such a world and yet uphold the Ninth Commandment, which is to um, protect, essentially to protect your neighbor's good name, not bear false witness against your neighbor? We talked about that last week. Well, today we move on to the Tenth Commandment, the Tenth Commandment which is you shall not covet. Specifically, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. That's verse 17 of Exodus chapter 20, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. In the 10th commandment, which I just read in Exodus 20 verse 17, there are seven things that you shall not covet that are listed. The first thing that you shall not covet is your neighbor's house. And the seventh thing that you shall not covet is anything that is your neighbor's. They're the same thing. Your neighbor's house and anything that is your neighbor's are the same thing because everything that is your neighbor's is in your neighbor's house. So you do not covet your neighbor's house. You do not covet anything that is your neighbor's. And you do not covet all those things in between, the five things that are mentioned because those are all the things in your neighbor's house. So essentially you respect what belongs to your neighbor. Seven, of course, is the number of completion in the Bible. We have seven days in a week. That's a complete week. And seven is the number of completion. And there are seven things here we are not to covet. So you are just not to covet at all. It's just complete not coveting. Never, 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 never covet. That's what we're being told here. The completely no coveting allowed in your heart. And so this is coveting, talking about coveting anything at all, anything at all, because things either belong to somebody else or they belong to you. If they belong to you, they're yours. You have a right to protect them. But if they belong to somebody else, they're somebody else's and they're not yours and you cannot covet them. So you cannot covet what belongs to somebody else. This is forbidding, coveting completely. Seven things you shall not covet, beginning with your neighbor's your neighbor's house and ending with anything that is your neighbor's. Anything that is your neighbor's is in your neighbor's house, and they're all listed here in verse 17. You shall not covet. Coveting is the mother of all sins. If you didn't know that, well, I want you to know that today. It's interesting that the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me, and the tenth commandment is you shall not covet. Well, Anytime you break one of the Ten Commandments, you're breaking both of those commandments. You're breaking Commandment 1 and you're breaking Commandment 10. Anytime you break one of the Ten Commandments, you're for sure breaking Commandment 1 because you're putting something else before God, and you're for sure breaking Commandment 10 because you're desiring something that you shouldn't be desiring in your heart. That's what coveting is. It's desiring what you're not to desire. It's desiring the forbidden, which is that which belongs to your neighbor. So coveting is the mother of all sins. If you don't covet, you won't sin. It's the mother of all sins. And this is the sin, coveting, is, it is the sin that carries all the other sins in on its back. If another sin comes into the room, it's because, because coveting gave it a piggyback ride into the room. It was right there on coveting's back. Okay, if Mr. Adultery walks into the room, it's because Mr. Coveting took him in there. If Mrs. If Mrs. Stealing walked into the room, it's because Mrs. Coveting brought her into the room. Every sin is brought into the room by coveting. Coveting is, is the mother of all sins. It's the box truck in which all the other sins are filled up. And then it dumps all the other sins. So this is what carries the sins. It loads all the sins in and then backs up and here you go. Here's all the other sins. Coveting is the mother 
of all sins. This is the locomotive. And this is the locomotive that drives all the boxcars. The locomotive propels the boxcars down the track, and in all the boxcars are all the other sins. Coveting is the locomotive. It is the driving force behind every single sin in the Bible. If you don't covet, you don't sin. If you do covet, it leads to manifold sins. This is the locomotive. This is the box truck. This is the one who gives all the other sins a piggyback ride. Wilhelmus A. Brackle said of coveting, he said, that which gives birth to sin is sin itself. And this particular sin is sin because it gives birth to other sins. This is the one that is pregnant with all the other sins. It's pregnant with all the other sins. If you kill this sin, you kill the other sins. Eve, and this is important for you, pay attention to what I'm about to say here. Eve wasn't able to resist coveting in her state of innocence in the Garden of Eden before she had the sin nature. She didn't resist coveting. And if so, Eve didn't resist coveting in the state of nature or the state of innocence, how much harder is it for you to resist coveting in your sin nature? Eve beheld the fruit and desired it. She found it desirable. She coveted before she ate it. And she did that in her state of innocence. If Eve is going to do that in her state of innocence, how much more likely is it that you're going to do that in your state of corruption when you're poisoned by sinful desires? So let me outline this sermon today as I've introduced all the other Ten Commandments, I think. I'm going to outline it very similarly. I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to ask the question, what is covetousness? So I'll define my terms. Then I'm going to ask the question, why is covetousness sin? Why is this sin? Why is this such a bad thing? And then I'm going to ask, how does this 10th commandment apply? What is covetousness? Why is it sin? How does the 10th commandment apply? Let's talk about what is, let's answer the question, what is covetousness? What is covetousness? Well, at its very root, covetousness is discontentment with your lot. God gives you a lot in life. He gives you certain gifts. He gives you certain abilities. He gives you certain assets. He gives you the ability to acquire certain assets. And covetousness is discontentment with your lot. You look at what God's given you. You look at your life the way it is. And you say, God was wrong to give me only this. I want more. I'm not satisfied with what God's given me. And it's essentially saying, when you covet, you're essentially saying you deserve more than what God's given you. It's entitlement. This is an entitled generation, so this should be a very applicable text to all of us. But it's discontentment with your lot in life at its very heart. And it is an inordinate, with that discontentment, becomes an inordinate desire for what's not yours. You say, I'm not happy with what I have, with what God's given me. And I look over at somebody else down, down yonder and I say, I want what he has. And until I get what he has, I'm not going to be happy. Wilhelmus A. Brockle described it as a howling emptiness and a greedy yearning for something which is not possessed. And it is, according to Luke chapter 12, verse 15, it's wanting more and more. Jesus said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. One of the Puritans described this world as an ocean. And oceans are good for sailing. Because you need them to sail and move fast across the waterways. They help you transport goods and transport people. But... If you start putting the ocean in your boat, it sinks your boat. And covetousness is wanting to put the ocean in your boat. You're sailing across. God's given you these material things. They're designed for a purpose, and the purpose is God's honor and glory. And covetousness is wanting to load your boat 
with more than what God's given you and you load your boat with all the ocean and it eventually sinks your boat. That's covetousness. Edward Fisher described it. He says, in this last commandment, I should just mention this, there's a word in here. It's, the word is concupiscences. It's a big word. I don't know how many of you heard it, but the word concupiscence is a really good lear- word to learn. It's an old word. We don't use it much anymore. Probably most of you've never heard it. Maybe some of you have. But I think it's a word we should bring back because it is describing this very sin, the desire for the forbidden. That's covetousness. And Edward Fisher said, this last commandment deals with those sins which are called only concupiscences. Big word, good word to learn. And do contain all inward striving and conceit in the understanding and affections against every commandment of the law, and are, as it were, rivers boiling out of the fountain of that original sin. These are the rivers that boil out of original sin. All these other commandments. And this is where they all originate. This is where they all originate. This is the reservoir of sin. This is the well of sin. And all the other sins gush out of this one. Covetousness. Covetousness. You know what covetousness is? Covetousness is this. I'll sin to get it, and I'll sin if I don't get it. I'm willing to sin to get it, and I will definitely sin if I don't get it. I'll do whatever it takes to get it, sin, and if I don't get it, I'm going to have a sulky temper tantrum. Covetousness. Coveting. I will only be happy if blank coveting unless blank i will not be happy that's coveting you're you're willing to sin to get it you'll sin if you don't get it i will only be happy if blank or unless blank i will remain unhappy what is it whatever you put in that blank is what you're coveting Right now, that's coveting. It's hard, it's it's discontentment. Let Let me describe, list for you a few instances of covetousness in the Bible. Ahab was a covetous king. What did he covet? Well, he coveted Naboth's vineyard. And when Ahab didn't get Naboth's vineyard, what did he do? He sulked. Right? He went home and he sucked his thumb, basically. Like King John and Robin Hood, essentially. And by the way, if you are teaching your children that it's okay to sulk when they don't get what they want, you're training little King Ahabs. And if you give your children what they want... When they sulk, you're training little King Ahabs. That's all you're doing. Some parents, they give their kids what they want when they throw a temper tantrum and they sulk. Well, just call your kid King Ahab when you do that. Because that's exactly what you're training up. He sulked when he didn't get what he wanted. And then when he didn't get what what he wanted, his wife couldn't handle the fact that he was sulking. So she went about and slandered Naboth, and eventually that slander led to Naboth's murder. His covetousness led to slander, which led to murder. But Naboth's first sin, or Ahab's first sin in that whole story, was his sulking. You see, he sinned when he didn't get it. He was willing to sin to get it, and he sinned by wanting it. Naboth. How about Eve? Eve was covetous for the forbidden fruit. Scriptures tell us she desired the forbidden. And the desire was the first sin. She was willing to sin to get it, and she sinned in wanting it. Eve. How about David? King David, what did he do? Well, he was covetous for Bathsheba. He saw her bathing, and he desired to know her nakedness. So he actually committed sin in his heart before 
he had intimate relations with another man's wife. He desired her nakedness in his heart. And in desiring her, na her nakedness, that was the original sin in that particular instance. So he, he was willing to sin to get what he wanted, committed adultery, which eventually led to murder, with Sheba's husband, and lies. And what he wanted was sin in and of itself. You sin to get it, you sin if you don't get it, and you sin by wanting it. That's covetousness. How about Joseph's brothers? Jacob had 12 sons. And a number of those sons conspired to sell their brother Joseph into slavery. Why? Number one, they coveted his coat of many colors. And they coveted what was behind that coat of many colors, which was his father's affection for him. Jacob had a favorite son. That was clear. His favorite son was Joseph. That was clear. And what did his brothers do? They sinned because they coveted Jacob's special affection for his, special, for his favorite son, Joseph, which led to them selling him into slavery and then lying to their father. So what, what, what am I talking about here? When I talk about coveting, you're, you're sinning by wanting it, perhaps. You're sinning if you don't get it. You're sinning to get it. That's coveting. You're willing to sin to get it. You're willing to sin if you don't get it. And you're sinning by wanting it. Covetousness is the sinful desire that gives birth to the sinful action. You see what this 10th commandment is, is communicating to you? So... The commandment to, to not commit adultery, what's that communicate? That communicates that God is Lord over your marriage. The commandment to honor the Sabbath, what's that communicate? God's Lord over your time. The commandment to not steal, what's that communicate? God's Lord over your stuff, your property. The commandment to not covet, what's that communicating? God's Lord over your heart. He owns your heart. He doesn't just own your stuff. He doesn't just own your time. He doesn't just own your marriage and your family. He doesn't just own his worship. So the commandment do not make unto yourself any graven image communicates to us. He's Lord of your heart. He has prerogative over your innermost desires. And this is forbidding those things which you are not to desire and implicitly commanding those things which you ought to desire. God owns the affections of your heart. Coveting is essentially wrongly ordered affections. It's, you want to boil it down? Yes, it's willing to sin to get it. It's willing to sin if you don't get it. It's sinning, and, it's sinning and desiring it. But essentially, it's wrongly ordered affections. Wrongly ordered desires. That's what coveting is. 1 John 2, verse 16 called it the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions. Coveting. Wrongly ordered desires. So I hope I've answered the question for you. And my first point here, what is coveting? Now what I want to ask is, why is covetousness sin? And I'll give you several reasons why it's sin, but I want to ask this question, why is covetousness sin? And I'll give you several reasons why it's sin, but I'm going to get to the root of the issue immediately. And then I'm going to go on to some further reasons beyond that as to why it's sin. But I want to get to the absolute root of why it's sin immediately in this little point here. Why is covetousness sin? And covetousness is sin because it is the belief that God is not enough for you and he does not provide what you need. That's why it's sin. It's functional atheism. Functional atheism. Hebrews 13 verse five, which I read during communion, 
It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with all, with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you for, or forsake you. So to violate that commandment means you're being covetousness, you're being covetous, and you're saying that the presence of God is not enough and what God has given you is not enough. You don't believe what God says, and therefore you don't believe in God. God says he's enough. God says he gives you enough. And when you're covetous, when you possess covetousness, you're saying that God is not enough and God has not given you enough. That's covetousness. So when you're looking over your fence and you're looking at your neighbor's house and you're looking at your neighbor's lifestyle and you're saying, I'm so mad that I can't have that, what you're saying is you don't think God is enough and you don't think God has given you enough. Covetousness. It's functionally atheism. You don't believe what God says about himself. It's a denial of the faith. Functionally, it is atheism, it is unbelief, it is denial of God in the heart. And even if you say that you believe in God with your lips, but, you, but with covetousness, you can say that you believe in God with your lips, but you can harbor these resentments and this discontentment and this stirring in your heart and you can harbor that in your heart, so you're denying him in your heart. So essentially, if you're a covetous Christian, you're a hypocrite, you're a Pharisee. You're honoring him with your lips, but your heart is far from him. You're a Pharisee, a covetous Christian. It is functional atheism. If you profess belief, but are full of covetousness and discontent, you are a hypocrite and a functional atheist because you do not believe that God is enough and you do not believe that he will give you what you need or has given you what you need and you have covetousness in your heart which is unbelief, it's a denial of God so you can say you're a Christian, you can worship God at church with words coming out of your mouth, you can even read your Bible every day, you can utter prayers every morning. And every night before you go to bed, and you can tell people that you're a Christian, but if your heart is full of covetousness, you are denying God in your heart. You are living outwardly as a Christian, but internally you are an atheist. It's covetousness. So that's why it's sin at the heart. It's a denial of God as he defines himself. Beyond that, it's the mother of all sins. So that's the root issue. The root issue is it's a denial of God. It's atheism, functionally. But furthermore, as I want to get into this even deeper, it's the mother of all sins. Coveting is the female snake, and all the other sins are her eggs. And she carries them around in her belly and then gives birth to them, and they hatch. That's covetousness. The female snake and all the other sins are her eggs and offspring. Each commandment, you can't break any of the one, any of the Ten Commandments without coveting at all. It's impossible to break the Ten Commandments if you don't have covetousness in your heart. So we can look at each one of the commandments. First commandment is verse 3 of Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. So if you're, if you're putting another God before God, what are you doing? You're coveting another God. You're dissatisfied with God. Commandment two in verses four through six of Exodus 20 is you should not make for yourself a carved image. What's that communicating? Well, God defines his own worship. And so if you start worshiping God in a way that he has not commanded or in a way that he has forbidden, you are coveting a different form of worship other than what God has decreed. The third commandment in verse 7 is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You covet irreverence. You are dissatisfied with irreverence. Or if you're taking the Lord's name as a swear word, you're coveting another situation because you're using God's name to declare your anger and therefore pronouncing a curse on God and upon your, and upon your situation. Coveting. If you break the fourth commandment, in verse 8 through 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
What you are coveting is you're coveting your own use of your time. You're saying, what God has given me in the six days is not enough. I'm dissatisfied with the six days, so I'm taking a seventh day. I'm not giving that seventh day to the Lord. I'm taking it for myself. It's coveting. You're stealing God's time. You violate the fifth commandment, which is in 20 verse 12, honor your father and your mother. What you're doing is you are coveting another family. You're saying, I'm dissatisfied with this family that God's given me. I will not seek to have the relationship I'm supposed to have with my parents. I will not seek to have the relationship I'm supposed to have with my family, my children, and my siblings. I will, I'm, I'm dissatisfied with the family that God's put me in. And by being dissatisfied with the family you're, put, you're, you're, you're being put in, you're coveting something else other than what, where God's put you in life. You're coveting another position in life. And that's why someone would violate the fifth commandment. Sixth commandment, 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. What you're doing is you're coveting somebody else's life. The world would be better without that person, therefore I will snuff him out. You're coveting somebody else's life. I am dissatisfied with that person being in the world. God's prerogative is to give birth and to kill, but I am going to take it upon me to kill and so I want, to, I want something other than what God's designed. And so someone who murders is coveting another person's life. They want them dead. 20 verse 14, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. You're coveting somebody else's wife, somebody else's husband. You're dissatisfied with your wife. You're dissatisfied with your husband. You're dissatisfied with your singleness. So you're desiring sexual immorality. So that's the seventh commandment. Coveting leads to all the violations of, or the eighth commandment, or seventh commandment. Coveting leads to all the violations of the seventh commandment. The eighth commandment, 20 verse 15, you shall not steal. When you steal, you're coveting somebody else's stuff, their property. You're dissatisfied with your stuff, and so coveting property will lead to theft. And then the ninth commandment, 20 verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What you're doing is you're coveting something other than the truth. You desire to live in an alternate reality, in an anti-reality. And so in desiring to live in an anti-reality, you tell lies. And you try to fabricate your own reality. And in fabricating your own reality, you're doing so because you're coveting an anti-reality. So what have I just done here? I've tried my best to explain to you that coveting is the mother of all sins. This is the snake, and all the other sins are the eggs in her belly. They're all offspring of this particular snake, the mother of all sins. Unlike the other commandments, it's distinct from the other nine because the verb is repeated two times in an independent clause with a different direct object. And so there's something emphatic about this. The commandment is repeated two times in independent clauses with different direct objects. It's special. W.S. Plumer, speaking of covetousness, he said, Fire can never be extinguished by pouring oil upon it. The more a worldling possesses, the more he desires. He's right. What is covetous? Well, one of the reasons that covetousness is sin, I just talked about it, it's the mother of all sins. It's expressing functional atheism. And then beyond that, what it does is it creates the desire for more sins. So if you're covetous for something and then you get that something, then you're going to be covetous for even more of something else. Sin always begets sin, is begets sin, begets sin. There's no going back without full-throated repentance. So, so coveting, when you... It, Coveting for something, and you think, I'll only be satisfied when I get this. That's like a fire saying, I will only die out if somebody pours gas on me. That's when, you, when you're saying, I'm, I'm only going to be happy when this happens, and when I get this, that's like a fire saying, I will only be quenched when somebody pours a jerry can of gas on me. Which couldn't be further from the truth. 
When you covet and you get what you want, you want more and more. And your appetites become insatiable. It's never enough. It's like pouring oil upon a fire. And coveting, by the way, I'm talking about why it's so bad. I've given you a bunch of reasons. It's the mother of all sins. It's functional atheism. It can never be satisfied. It's a total waste of energy. God's given you energy to use for good. And what do you do when you're, when you're coveting? You're using your energy, your mental energy, your physical energy. You're using it for bad. You're, you're using it to get what God hasn't given you. It's not yours to take. And so essentially what you're doing is you're, is you're hunting d- disease-infested rats with golden bullets. Why would you ro- waste that gold on a disease-infested rat? Why would you do that? Why don't you spend that gold for a better purpose? That's what coveting is. It's a waste of energy. You're, you're just totally wasting things that you could put to better use. And it leads to death. Always. One of the things, one of the Puritans said, it's those people who covet, they're like the fly or the bee that wants honey but gets stuck in the honey pot and dies in there. That's what coveting is. It's you want the honey, the honey tastes good, the honey smells good, the honey looks good, you go for the honey, you die in the honey. That's coveting. I want, I take, I die. Coveting. In fact, this is an important lesson for us, is God actually killed people for coveting food. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5 through 6 says, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. That's speaking of people who complained about the food and the drink that God provided them after the exodus. And then it says in verse 6, now these things took place and is an example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. They had the wrong desires. They desired what God didn't give them. Give them. They had forbidden desires and their forbidden desires for their forbidden desires, God killed them. And in this case, it was food. They weren't content with the food that God gave them. I'll talk about this in a little bit. But if you are allowing your children to complain about the food that you put in front of them at dinner, you are setting them up for death. You might think that's a a minor, trite thing. No, you're putting them on a trajectory. Father worked very hard to provide the food. Mother worked very hard to prepare the food. All the family worked very hard to get together for this dinner hour. And then one little brat wants to whine about the food. All these people came together for this food. And worked for it. And then one little brat says it's not good enough. You are setting your child up to die if you put up with that in your home. Children should come to the dinner table with thankful hearts. I don't care if they don't like Brussels sprouts. I didn't like it either, and my mother said you're eating it, and now I like it. It's funny how that works. I actually used to have a gag reflex. And my mother said you will eat those Brussels sprouts. I ate the Brussels sprouts, now I like Brussels sprouts. It is quite amazing how these things work. Which is proof that your desires can change if they're properly cultivated. If you starve your evil desires and you feed your good desires, your desires change. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, speaking of desires, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So there you go. It's the denial of God. It says it right there in the Bible. It's common. It's very common, and it's very difficult to detect. It can be nursed secretly. Your desires can be nursed secretly. You can come to church. You can look like a great Christian. You can act like a great Christian. You can say your prayers and read your Bible in the morning. And you can hide the covetousness. So it's very common to have, and it's very difficult to detect. In a society, this is important for us to understand. Is I, what am I talking about right now? I'm talking about why it's so bad. A society... Characterized by covetousness is a society that is under the wrath of God. 
Exodus 34, verse 23 through 24 says, Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. So the males are going to go and they're going to gather together for worship in this text. Now, in a, in a wicked society, that would be a scary thing because they're now vacating their homes and they're leaving their women and children alone. And so somebody could do and bring harm to their children or somebody could take their stuff or their wife. And it says in verse 24, however, for I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. When God's smile is upon a people, there's no one coveting your stuff. There's no one sitting around saying, I'm furious that he has a bigger house than me. I'm furious that he drives a nicer car than me. I'm furious that he has a bigger business than me, that he can afford the latest equipment or the latest tractor or whatever it is. There's nobody doing that because everyone is content within his lot, and that's a sign that God is happy with a people. But when you now have to have alarm systems installed in your house and you have to lock your doors at night and you have to protect your children from bad people, that's a sign that God is angry with the people. I can tell you this. I, I remember when my grandparents told me they grew up in Toronto and didn't have to lock their doors at night. That was a society that God was present with. But now you have to lock your doors in the day when you're at home, don't you? In most places in the city where you live. Why is that? Because God has removed his presence from the land. When I did mission work, the little bit I did in Nepal, I had a, there was a man in Nepal there who told me that he wouldn't leave his home because he was afraid that if he left his home, somebody would come and take his daughter. You, you tell me what that is. That's a society where the wrath of God is sitting upon it because now you're afraid that somebody's going to steal your children. But it is a society that has God's smile on it when nobody even desires what is forbidden. But God's wrath comes on a society, and you know that God's wrath is on a society because people are desiring the forbidden, and now you're afraid to leave your stuff, your home, and your loved ones without protection. One of the blessings of God's of God in the Bible when he's blessing a society is that the little children will play in the streets. When I was a kid, we could play in the parks and we wouldn't be afraid of stepping on needles. That would have been unheard of. The whole city, I grew up in Guelph, the whole city was our playground. I could bike anywhere I wanted unless, as long as I was home by the time the street lights come on. And even if I was home after the streetlights come on, I'd get in trouble, but it wasn't really dangerous. And now what do we live in? A society that is full of danger and distrust. Why? Because it's because of covetousness. And why is it full of covetousness? Because God is displeased with us. No amount of law enforcement and legislation will change this. It has to come from the hearts of the people a crying out to God for mercy. Covetousness, when it is absent, contentment is present, and that's indicative that God is Lord of the hearts of the people. So why is covetousness sin? Covetousness is sin because it is functional atheism, it's the mother of all sins. It can never be satisfied. It leads to death. It's uneasy to detect, and it's a sign of God's judgment on society. That's why it's sin. At the very heart, it's atheism. So I've, a I've answered the question, why is covetousness sin? Let's get into some application now. How does this apply? How does the 10th commandment apply? What is covetousness? Why is it sin? I've answered those questions. How does it apply? Well, within this commandment is the others. There's a prohibition. Don't be covet. Don't, don't covet. Don't be covetous. And there's a duty. And the duty is the opposite of the prohibition. The duty is what? 
Be content and thankful. That's the duty. But let's talk about the prohibition for a minute. The prohibition means that you don't obsess over getting your neighbor's stuff. And people do this. I think Micah chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 tells us this. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Look, did you understand what this is describing? In Micah 2, verses 1 through 2, it's describing socialism and communism. If you don't have covetousness, you don't have socialism and communism. Covetousness is simply socialism, or sorry, communism and socialism are simply covetousness applied in public policy. I want what my neighbor has, therefore I vote for the person who will take what my neighbor has and give to me. That's all it is. If you don't have covetous people, you won't have socialism, you won't have communism, which are political, which is just political covetousness. The Tenth Commandment protects private property. The Tenth Commandment protects marriages. The Tenth Commandment protects families. The Tenth Commandment protects free markets because it is forbidding at the very root level the desire for what's not yours. And so think about this. Do you know how low the tax rate would be if people didn't covet? Do you realize how low it would be? Because first of all, if people don't covet, you, do, you need minimal law enforcement because people are self-governing. Minimal law enforcement. So there's tax burden cut. And then if people don't covet, you don't need social pro programs because they're not looking to take from their neighbor and give to themselves in the name of love, neighborly love. They just each wants to take responsibility for his own life. The Tenth Commandment protects you from being stolen from by the government so they can give to other people. This means if you're not going to covet, that prohibits being angry over somebody else's happiness. How many people do this? They see somebody happy and they're miserable. I can't stand that somebody's happy. This happened during COVID, I think. That's why a lot of people got mad at us because we were having a good time how dare they be happy at Trinity Bible Chapel? They should walk around in misery like the rest of us. It was the fear of being left out or of missing out, FOMO, as some people call it. I am convinced that was a big part of it. It was coveting the blessing of God. That's, and, and this is what, um, I mean, the Bible forbids it over and over again. And Cain and Abel, what was Cain's problem? Abel offered worship to God. Cain was jealous of Abel. Cain killed Abel. And that's exactly what happened during COVID. God blessed us and people were angry. Covet, covet, don't covet. It means you do not get jealous over somebody else's good looks. Women do this a lot. They get real catty sometimes over a woman that they're jealous of. They feel as intimidates them for their, her you know, for how beautiful she is. And then so they start to talk, oh, can you believe her? Blah, you know, and all this stuff happens all the time. Well, that means you're not jealous over somebody's good looks. It means you're not, you're not jealous over somebody's, you're not covetous over somebody's success, over somebody's wealth, over somebody else's virtue, over somebody else's reputation, over your boss's position. You're not covetous over the fact that somebody was born into a certain family and therefore by being born in that family has an advantage over you. That's God's prerogative. He decides what family you're born into. And you sit around and you complain about somebody that was born on third base and you were born at home plate or in the dugout. Well, that's God's business. You simply have to accept the hand that you've been dealt and it means that you do not desire forbidden sex. Look at this, Jeremiah 5, verse 7 through 8. How can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me and have sworn by those who are no gods. When I fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped to the houses of whores. 
They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. It's a society that has an insatiable appetite for sex. That's our society. Forbidden sex. You shouldn't be desiring premarital sex. You shouldn't be desiring porn. Adultery, and this is a problem, by the way. There was this whole movement several years ago. It's still going on, but there was this whole idea that you could have gay Christians. And what does that mean? It's like, well, they're Christians, and they have gay desires, but they just don't act out on those desires. Look, if you're a man, and you're desiring another man, first of all, that's disgusting, but secondly, that's desiring the forbidden. And, the, and I tell you what, I've talked to people who are in this boat, and bar none, every single one of them, every one of them, I can't get over this desire. I can't get over this desire. Every one of them I've ever talked to. Do you know what the problem is? They keep feeding the desire. They keep going back to the images on the computer. Keep going back to the books they shouldn't be reading. They feed it, they feed it, they feed it. Oh, I can't get over it. Well, stop feeding it. Only feed the desires that God wants you to have. And this is the whole idea with the transgenders. I, I covet to be another gender so bad that the individual who's in this is willing to mutilate his or her own body. That's how crazy this gets. And they're heroes now. You've got to starve the desires that are forbidden and feed the desires that are allowed. When you lose your temper, it's because you're not getting what you want. Maybe it's you want the kids to be quiet, you lose your temper. Well, you're coveting quiet now. Maybe you want the kids to respect you, you lose your temper. Well, now you're coveting respect. Maybe you want attention or politeness and you lose your temper when you don't get politeness or attention. Well, now you're coveting. You're coveting all those things. Anyone who's lost his or her temper has done so because he coveted something that he didn't get. God decided not to give it to him and then the coveting came out with the temper tantrum. Coveting, it's at the root of it all. 1 Timothy verses 6, 6 through 8. Or chapter 6, verse 6 through 8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take, take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Wilhelmus A. Brackle said, The nature of this virtue, speaking of contentment, consists in, be, in there being harmony between our desires and our present circumstances. It's that simple. So what am I doing now? I'm, I'm transitioning from the... Sin that's prohibited, don't covet, to the duty that's demanded, which is be content and thankful. And how are you content? You just line your desires up with the situation you're in. And now you're content, not comparing your lives with others. Wilhelm S. A. Brackle went on to say, learn to adjust your desires to your circumstances, regardless of what they may be. And do not endeavor to adjust your circumstances to your desires, for there will be no end to that. That's contentment. I'm happy with what Jesus has given me. John Calvin, in his poverty, when he is impoverished, said, I confess indeed that I am not poor, for I desire nothing more than what I have. It's a mindset. His, his wealth was a mindset. He had Jesus Christ. That was enough for him. And so I don't desire anything else. And if... You know, we're in a generation now that is measurably one of the first generations in the history of this country that everyone keeps saying this is, has less money than previous generations. Well, if you're not careful, demagogues can play on that and teach you that you're entitled to have more than the previous generation. When God's commandment, God's commandment is that you're content with what you have. Philippians 4, verse 11 through 12 says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This is godliness. Contentment includes being thankful for what you have, by the way. You know, some people in this generation that we live in, there's this guilt that's lauded on people who have much. As if they're supposed to feel guilty for their privilege. If you're privileged, you're not supposed to feel guilty for that. You're supposed to be thankful for that. That's the way I was taught when I was a kid. You don't run around feeling guilty that you have more than somebody else. You, you are grateful to God for what you have. And don't let everyone else's covetousness damper your day. If they're covetous, it's not your problem, it's their problem. You just be grateful, happy with what you have. Your privilege is God's gift to you. So you don't feel shame, but you be content. You know, one Puritan described contentment like a watch on your arm. What does the watch do? Well, I can move my arm around anywhere I want, and my watch still keeps the time. It's just ticking. The numbers are still there. The gears are still working properly. It just slowly ticks the way it's designed to tick. That's how you're supposed to be. Whatever position God puts you in, you just keep doing what God wants you to. Content. You remain unchanged. This pours into all relationships. You know, if somebody comes to you and they have good news, you, you know it's a real terrible, discontent, miserable thing to do and say, well, must be nice. What an awful thing to do. People do that all the time. Someone gets a raise, right? So somebody buys a new house. Somebody gets a new car. Somebody goes on a vacation. And what's the first? Must be nice. Well, you're, I'm sorry, but you're covetous. You're expressing discontent in your situation. You know what a content person would say? A content person would say, I'm so happy for you. I'm so grateful that God's blessed you. I am rejoicing with you in that. G gratitude and celebration, entering into that person's joy. A discontent person, someone comes to you with sorrow and expresses sorrow, and you're secretly covetous of that person, then you think, I'm glad they you know, got kicked a little bit. But, a, but a, a content person, someone comes to you with sorrow, and you, and you enter into that sorrow. You rejoice with those who rejoice, and you mourn with those who mourn. That's contentment. You're content with what you have, and you're content with what God's allotted to another person. This means that that bosses will get along with employees, the rich will get along with the poor, the higher classes with the lower classes, the men will get along with the women. You know what feminism was? It was discontentment. That's all it is, discontentment. Woman says, I don't like the, way, the place that God's put me in, and so I wanna be like a man. It's interesting. When I was a kid, I remember sitting with my grandfather. He was talking to me about feminism, and he, he said, the next thing you know, they're going to want urinals in the women's washrooms. <laughs> One thing led to the next. Uh, he didn't see it coming, but it came. Right? Be content with your vocation. The, the job that God's given you, work it. Don't be chasing this, that, and the other thing. Work with the opportunities that God gives you. Be content with your wife. Be content with your husband. Be content with your children. Be content with your parents. I hope you don't have secret desires for another man's wife. Secret desires for another woman's husband. And you're harboring them. Nobody knows them but you. God knows them. That's vile. It's forbidden. You ought to be content with what you have, not discontent with what God's given you. Don't say, well, you, start com you compare your husband to this guy or that guy or the other. My husband's not like this or your wife. My wife's not like this. You need to get over that. Stop feeding those forbidden appetites and be content. So what have I done here? I'm going to review. I've asked the question, what is covetousness? Then I've asked the question, why is covetousness sin? Then I've asked the question, how does the 10th commandment apply? What is covetousness? Why is it sin? 
how is it applying? And that's my summary of my sermon outline. And it comes down to if you trust in Jesus, you'll be content. It's simple trust in Jesus. Being content means you're not coveting. Coveting is the mother of all sins. If you simply trust in Jesus, you don't sin. You're not going down those roads because you're content in Jesus. You're happy in Jesus. You're declaring, as Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, you're declaring that his presence is enough for you. It's enough. Is it? Is he enough for you? Because by being discontent, you're saying you need something other than Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray to you. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for his love for us. We thank you for his kindness. And we acknowledge that he is enough. Forgive us for the times when we think otherwise. And please direct the desires of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.